Oh, he avoided tea in the face this time. Great talk, glad we had it. Did he put the tea on her head at every win, or did he splash her? Seems like they're getting along better. That was a very uh, cheerful intro. Episode 26, new mission. To what I have a feeling will be the beginning of darkness. A few months earlier... Space warps. She's got the inception ability. Also connected to music. House Flippy Guy's power was connected to drums. Lower five isn't coming. This feels like a preview for season two. That is not the voice I expected. Oh. Is that where this is going? What the hell was that? Oh, he's a new form. Ruling with an iron fist. Wow. Rui gets himself killed and they bear the weight. That creates sort of a crazy level of power for the upper ranks. Not one has been defeated. And he's got telepathy. And as crazy as that is, that means that Muzan is also one, at least one level, probably multiple levels higher than that even. Like so many levels have just been established. We had Tanjiro, who in my perception was the strong person we were following, who then enters this world of the Hashira, where even the Hashira's butterfly disciples are, are faster and better than him. But those Hashira, as powerful as they are, struggle with the lower demons, who are nothing compared to the higher demons, which are nothing compared to Muzan. So like a really cool power hierarchy that's been established. And it's kind of pretty, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> this is what happens when you start a sentence in your own mind. Don't think, just not turn your brain off. Yes, you pledged allegiance to the wrong master. Oh no, even when she's saying things in support of him. Total- oh wow. Well, I think we see another reason why the lower ranks change so often. Yeah, he sort of made up his mind. To a certain degree. Bold of him! Oh. <laughs> I still bold. But he's not gonna make it. Yeah, and with this, Muzan's domination is complete by showing them they have no option at all. Also, his powers are somewhat unclear, or the extent of his powers are unclear, which makes me even more terrifying. This is cruel, like, if you're gonna kill them, why even bother lecturing them? He's gonna leave some of them alive, though. This is a tactic. How to create mastery and control over people in five easy steps. A book by Muzan. Step one, find people who are in a state of despair with no perceived way of getting out and offer them a way out. Step two, actually give them the things they're lacking. Give them a sense of power and purpose. Maybe say some nice things about them. Give them some compliments. Step three, ask for a small sacrifice. You know, just a, a tiny sacrifice. You know, I've done all this for you. You can do a little bit for me, right? Get people in the habit of compromising themselves for you and ignoring their instincts about you. Step four, create a need for you, which can include, but is not limited to, instilling the idea, perhaps correctly, that without you, they will return to a state that they are not willing to to return to, or will perhaps be in actual danger, whether it's psychic or physical or whatever. Step five, control the narrative so that everything they see that is wrong with this is because of their fault and their failings and their weaknesses. Keep them off balance so that they never have the emotional space to gain healthy footing to question what you're doing or to make anything better for themselves. <laughs> you have no leverage here. Right, someone's gonna be left alive though. You are amazing, master. Yeah, yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Everything you did was great. You are divine. And see how easily I fit into your control plans, your controlling structure. I am the perfect servant. I have deemed you worthy <laughs> of life. 
Well, oh, oh, oh. Oh, he's giving him more power. Yeah. There's like a evolutionary strategy to what he's doing. Like anyone who's not perfect just dies, leaving only the people that are the most loyal, most powerful, most dedicated, most insane. He's he's holding a grudge. Holding a grudge against Tanjiro. I wonder if there's more. I wonder if there's more to it than that. Like recognizing Tanjiro's legacy as a threat. This seems to be the next villain. On the plus side, we have fewer of the lower five to deal with, at least until he replaces them. <laughs> Company meetings, am I right? Always a chore. <laughs> we also give him an image, a memory, a target. Company incentive structures, am I right? <laughs> it's morning, wake up, time to go into that whole thing that we just saw. That's your, your fate. <laughs> Mugen Train, I've heard so much about it. He's so pretty. <laughs> Maybe this is the last of this kind of title card. He does that. He has very few internal obstacles. He also can grab teacups really fast. Yeah, I feel like this is going to be more relevant than we know right now. Right. A new future crew member? She said sternly, as always. It's not for everyone, I guess. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot that he just said. Sweet though. I mean, it's an idea I always like, you know, like small actions for the good or actions that seem small are undoubtedly, to me, indisputably bigger than they seem just because of how interconnected everything is and how the smallest things can have the biggest impacts and the notion that what we see is always just going to be the surface level, the most immediate link in the chain of cause and effect. Whereas in reality, that chain is super long and almost infinite in its complexity. <laughs> <laughs> what were you expecting? Maybe she'll speak. Pails. Hey, there it is. What was heads? Hey, don't push your luck. I'm not, not here for a whole conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Take a hint, Tanjiro. Breathe the air. That is such a great reflection of Tanjiro. <laughs> Thinking for yourself or not? That's a big flip. <laughs> such a dramatic way to handle this. I love it. Huge risk, though. You guys ever hear this method? I mean, everyone knows the concept of flipping a coin to decide an outcome, but an extra layer to that is if you really tell yourself you're going to commit to the outcome. In that moment, as you watch the coin descending, carrying your, your fate with it, your emotions tell you what the true answer is. True story that is going to be hard to believe, but it's true. Last summer when I was in New York making preparations to move to Seoul, I met a girl from an island in Korea called Jeju. And after falling in love with her, I had to make the choice whether or not to follow my plans and wait for a student visa and move to Seoul, do everything by the book, and sort of let that relationship die because of time. You know, time sort of has a way of killing relationships that aren't strong. And also she wasn't in Seoul. Or forget all of that, dispose with all safety nets and move to her island without any guarantees of anything. And I was so torn about this idea that I resorted to a coin flip and I flipped the coin and it came up Seoul and I didn't like it. And so I flipped the coin again and it came to Seoul. All in all, I flipped the coin either seven or eight times. I can't remember exactly. And only one time did it come up Jeju. So like, if you believe in universal signals or signs or whatever, it's hard to get more clear than that, right? But the entire time, my heart was screaming at me that I hated those results. And so I did the opposite. I decided to forego with all plans and all guarantees. And I moved to Jeju and am now in a relationship with that person. Although it was a 
door to destiny I never would have anticipated. It's been all sorts of things. It's It's been perfection in moments and it's been passionate and it's also been devastating and, and terrible and hellish. It's brought out some darkness in me that I didn't know existed and also shed light on things I, I didn't know I had in me. And it's ongoing and I don't know how it will end and I don't know what I will become, you know, what I will be transformed into. Although I have a general sense of faith that it's for, for the best, that it's something I needed to learn and that I will win a victory one way or the other in the sense that it will be me becoming a better version of myself, being wiser and stronger. And speaking of spiritual sort of fate-like things, I just get the sense that the reason I was so compelled towards that decision, or at least part of the reason, was because on some instinctual level, I knew this was the greater adventure. So I feel like without even seeing the outcome, I already know the answer for Kanao is her name. Despite her lack of dialogue, I think it's pretty clear what the path of maximal adventure is for her. <laughs> Just as soon as we find it. Just as soon as we find the coin. There we go. What does your heart tell you right at this moment? There you go. Oh. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Exactly. I understand it so well. Because you already know in your heart what it is. It's just a vehicle to look at things more objectively or abstractly. This is a, a love interest, isn't it? This is a this is it, yeah. But before you go, the ultimate gourds. They all did it, not just Tanjiro. That's great. The, the scale is sort of off. Like after what we just saw with Muzan, they're you know breaking ceramics, which is cool, but they got bigger fish to fry. Thank you for believing in us from the beginning. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a real honor right there. And then teleport. <laughs> Heartbroken. <laughs> yeah. Mostly Tanjiro, though. I love Yunusuke's, like, cotton ball, cotton ball emotions. <laughs> oh, no, calling him out. But yeah, you should do that. I will miss our nightly carpet beatings, though. That was the part I enjoyed the most. Here's a train. Why do they call it Mugen Train? Is it the train's name? This is getting off to a great start, this arc. Fighting a train and police. <laughs> My man's a badass. He's not long. That's interesting. I feel like, like what is the utility of keeping demons a secret? I feel like people deserve to know. This thread is out there. Let's solve a lot of problems. I don't see a lot of downside. You don't cover art, Zenitsu. <laughs> that would be so sad if you got left behind again. I don't know, I feel like safety is just the thing we have to be able to dispense with for a while. There's no safety anywhere. Looking back on, on their journeys, there's a lot to look back on. A little glamour profiling. A little flashback. Building some hype for season two. <laughs> they just wanted an opportunity to show this off again, didn't they? <laughs> now that I'm complaining, it's pretty great. And there's the lower one or six or whatever with newfound power and dedication. On the Mugen train. Who even knows what it will be, this arc? I'm sure it'll be great. The end. Unwavering Resolve arc. Interesting. Didn't know it was called that. Oh, but no Taisho secret this time. Interesting. Wow, so that was season one. I gotta say that this show really took on life for me, starting with the introduction of the trio. There were elements of it I really liked before, like obviously the art and animation is beautiful, music's beautiful. Tanjiro fits neatly into that category of anime protagonist, but also feels a little bit more of an extreme in a good way in terms of his resolve and purity. Like he takes the, the protagonist trope and then goes all the way with that. You know what I mean? There's a comment I saw about Tanjiro that has stuck with me that said, Tanjiro is built different. And yeah, I mean, Tanjiro is built the same, but in that category, he is different, if that makes sense. He's such an advanced or extreme version of that thing. There's the setting, which is great. There's the mythological nature of some of the episodes. You know, they have a great sort of underlying folktale feeling that's really cool and refreshing. But the show got all the more exciting when 
we took all of that and added characters for which we can have bonds and character interplay. That's been sort of some of the most fun parts of watching the show develop over the final half of season one. And I feel like this is still only the beginning of that because we've just gotten a lot of introductions to characters. There's a lot of room to breathe, so to speak, for these new people, as well as for the primary three. I mean, there's still a lot of room to grow. Even for Tanjiro, there's a lot of room to grow, as we just witnessed in this awesome training arc. And I'm anticipating that simultaneously with that increased focus on character growth and really getting to deeply know and love the characters, we're now going to start going more into the demon villain structure and Muzan in a way that is made more exciting by the in increased stakes of being more vested in the characters. So there's so much potential for season two and of course subsequent seasons after that. So yeah, that is the end of season one. Thank you to everyone who has watched, supported, commented. Very much looking forward to seeing you for season two.